Mark, when did you first realise you wanted to be an artist? Oh, when I was here. So I was patient here back in the 90s and I was over at Wickham Park House. I was like, um, uh, it was a drug addiction unit. But, um, so I came here to do a detox and I was over there and they had all these facilities, you know, we were talking about Bethany and that. over there they've got like ceramic department, woodwork. So they have, um, uh, it's like kind of like art therapy. So I was like making things, they go, oh, you're really good. And I made this little small uh, ceramic. It was a person with their head in their hands and it, they put it into a show here. Oh, nice. And then I, ended, I left here and I went to um, First and House, which is uh, like another recovery place. And I was there for about six, nine months. And they had loads of art therapy there. And I went from there to Camberwell College of Art. Growing up in Peckham, I used to live up Telford Road. And then you would see, I saw that building the whole time, this art college. And there was like the, the South London Gallery next door. I knew it was there, never went in there. But you could see like artists around. They were, we used to think, oh, they're all fucking hippies, do you know what I mean? Because I was into football and that, but I saw them all there. And then I went, came out of like uh, drug addiction and like going through the Bethlehem into first and straight into Campbell College of Art because I was making art while I was in the hospital and everyone said it was really good. So I put all that kind of like addictive behaviour. I was making so many drawings, so many paintings. Yeah, just got really, like, never looked back since then. And, and that, how did you fit in at, at college? Yeah, that was, like, something else. I was, obviously, I was a mature student. I was, like, 37. When I turned up, there was, like, just loads of kids there, really. But I was all, thought I was the teacher. <laughs> but I'd just come from the streets of Peckham, do you know what I mean? I was, like, Mark, the mad smackhead from Peckham get into uni, I was doing all these drawings while I was in the hospital, get out, I end up with like loads of people saying to me, oh no, no, you can do, you don't just do painting and drawing here, you can do whatever you want. I was like, what do you mean? She says, yeah, whatever you want. And that's when it all kicked off. That's when I started doing all this kind of intervention into the media, into the art world. So I started pushing peanuts, rolling across London, crawling around, and like framing them as uh, art projects. But yeah, it's through that, but just, you can't say to someone who's been quite kind of like off it, do you know what I mean? Quite hedonistic, you can do whatever you want. I couldn't believe it. And then framed within the context of art. So it was like, you can't even get in trouble with the police, do you know what I mean? Because before, if you were thinking you're going to do something, it was always like you were going to get your collar felt, do you know what I mean? But now, you could go and express yourself and do these like really extraordinary things. Was that when, when you, so that when you was at uni, that was when you was getting into paper? Yeah. Okay. So that was when I catapulted the old woman, that was outside like um, Campbell College of Art. Yeah, and then I crawled, when I pushed the peanut, that was from Goldsmith, so I crawled from um, uh, Goldsmith, that was about student fees at the time, so I crawled along the road, pushing the peanut for seven miles, and I went to number 10 Downing Street, and it was, um, I handed it into um, Tony Blair was there at the time, wasn't he? So, yeah, the, on the news they were going, oh, at least there's one nut inside. We now we know there's at least one nut inside Downing Street. But they sent like some other bod out. It was like Charles Clark or someone like that, who was like the minister for education. Because they just stuck. That's when um, tuition fees. So where everyone was going to uni before, and it was like all free. Now they made everyone pay. But I really like uni, and I think it, you know I ended up like working at Camberwell. I did six years on the MA Fine Art teaching at Chelsea. And I really did, you know, I, I loved it. I loved it. But it's, it's so, um, it's such a business now. You know, it's just people just paying and getting degrees, you know, for, you know, there's no, no effort, there's nothing. But or I know in, in most 
art degree courses now. There's a module about marketing. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It, so it's but there's also because there's like there's no effort because nothing's put in because you don't get the teaching hours, you don't get like uh, the facilities. So you, basically, you're paying like what is it, nine thousand pound a year for a library card because that's all you get. Do you know what I mean? And then financial model is you know around Peckham and Camberwell, they've bought everywhere around there, and Goldsmiths around New Cross and Lewisham. They're bought everywhere. They're real estate. They're property magnets. So what their thing is, is they're buying up all the local things. They're like landlords and then renting it back to the students. Do you know what I mean? And so that's how they're making all their money because the government took all their money away. And they're still cleaning poverty. I know yeah. Goldsmiths are. They're, they're making all redundancies. Yeah, that's terrible as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how did you, your family feel when after kind of coming through this process, yeah. you went, I'm going to university now. Yeah, how yeah. was that? How was oh, that? They, were, they were like, they weren't having it. They were like, because I was on the telly, do you know what I mean? King cars, rolling around. They were going, oh, for fuck's sake, what's he doing? I remember like, uh, they, like my brother came like, because I did Dead Soldier, which was during the Iraq war. And I didn't, but it wasn't pro-war or anti-war. I just lied down in the road in Birmingham and I had a fatigues on, there was a big uproar about it, the sun were on the case, do you know what I mean? Going like this fucking this is outrageous. And my family went, Oh for God's sake, keep the kids off school, he's in the papers again. So then they all knew because at the beginning they would say, Yeah, that's my uncle and that but then afterwards when I kept seeing me, going, Have you seen your uncle? <laughs> What's he up to now? But the, the thing is, that you'd, you'd recognise the problem, is these people just see what the papers say. Yeah. But there was always a good message behind your stuff. It a good was. social message or a good socialist message. Yeah. And if you read that, then it makes sense. It ain't just Freud throwing a granny out of a cannon. Yeah. That was about benefits, when it? Was no, it was, a, it was about um, uh, trying to get younger people and older people, bring them together. So it was, um, I went to like the community, uh, I met some elderly people and it was like trying to give, bring them back into the community where they've been excluded, where, you know, younger people were being very disrespectful, you know, towards older people and about, you know, they are still got their lives, you know what I mean? They still can do anything. They can still go to space if they want to, you know. I think I think some of it is I, I kind of worked with the media as a like as a collaboration, so I would always have these quite eccentric kind of uh, performances, these events. But it was always like um, everyone enjoyed it. You know, they said, "Oh, that's really quirky, that's really funny." But it was always about carrying a message about something, like you say. And I think that that's how sometimes um, performance art. You know, like people do something silly and everyone goes, oh, what's that a bit of performance art? So performance art is, it's not linear. You know, like books or TV or, uh, you know, a film, Netflix, it's a story. But performance art's always very, uh, rubs against people. You can't read it as well. And even within the art world, it's a little bit like a lava lamp. It's a bit of a novelty. They would ask me, do you want to come and do a performance, the exhibition's opening, you come and do something. And you'd be treated almost like some kind of like organ grinder, monkey kind of like, just like go and do something funny for the people. But it's, it's like a lot of the stuff that I touched on was really serious, do you know what I mean? It was about loneliness, it was about a lot of it was shame based, you know, about how people suffering. And yeah, I mean, I really enjoyed that period. I'm the artist taxi driver now, which is a completely different thing but still really performative. This morning I was with my ther I've got a therapist now, so I wasn't getting on that well, so last year I ended up in trouble again, and ended up in the Bromley Drug and Alcohol Unit. So I had to go through, do a detox up there, and come back down through like uh, group therapy, and do some other stuff. So I've been going there since last July, but I've ended up with, like, a, with a therapist. But um, we were talking this morning about, so this character, the artist taxi driver, and she was, we were talking about, so where's Mark? 
you know, is it real? Like, what's are you playing this role of like being this taxi driver? You know, this role of being like, and it's very difficult, you know, because um, yeah, even through last year when I really wasn't well, I was super depressed. You know what I mean? But then lots of it's to do with cost of living crisis, and you know, it's a struggle out there for everybody. You know, I'm not nothing. No, everyone's suffering. So, you know, people have gone through this winter, keeping the heating off, even when they're cold, you know what I mean? Getting into bed early so they don't have to keep the heating on. You know, eating really sort of like lots of things like porridge and dal. You know, so um, spend less on food. So it's, it's a struggle for everyone, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's mental health stuff gets really attacked in all of that, you know, it's... It's hard for everybody, but um, you know, with debts and like people, everyone's in a predicament, or it feels like that. So a lot of the work that the taxi driver does is kind of reflective of like what's happening. But I didn't bring all that stuff in, and it was like almost like um, when I would do the the newspaper reviews in the morning, I'd just pull a mask over or I'd put my shades on, so I wasn't. You know, I wasn't showing what was really happening in my life because it was, you know, like Elvis. You know, there's a picture of Elvis when he comes off the stage and he's walking down that corridor and he's all by himself. You know, when he's on the stage, there's all those fans there and he was Elvis for that minute. But then when he came off, it was the traumas and the, you know, the addictions that he was going through and all the, the suffering that that poor guy. I mean, he died in his early forties, didn't he? But I, I see that the, the the taxi driver it's not like a pub landlord. Yeah, yeah. It's the complete opposite of what he is. He's an intelligent, uh, good, decent thinking man who's against all that geezer stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's like a, 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 it is a proper charade. It's, yeah. it's, it's a vehicle for comedy to really mock those kind of people. Yeah, yeah. Whereas, I see your, tax, your taxi driver, yeah. you ain't being the kind of, the opposite would be really right wing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well done Farage, he's, he's, he's you know, he, you're, you're ripping apart the, yeah. the, the government most of the time. You know, so, yes it is a mask and you can be a little bit of someone yeah. else, but it's, it's still, you're getting across your views. Yeah, yeah, so you've got like Keir Starmer coming through now as well, so that'll be the next fucking, Charade, won't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you've created discussions on what art is. W what's your version? I what mean, is art? Yeah, so, yeah, so, um, what was it? Clay Oldenburg famously wrote a piece like I'm for an art, and he just lists all these things like um, Pepsi Cola, dog shit, it's just a big list of everything's art. But um, I've really come back to my roots here. I feel like, you know, we've been to uni and then we feel like that's our, whatever you call it, alma mater. But here is where I belong. And we do workshops here. Like, uh, we have a writing group and we have art workshops. And it's everyone from the Bethlehem community. So it's like people who, who are on site and also people who are off site, service users who come in. So this gallery, Bethlehem Gallery, is, is for people, they represent people that have been through the Bethlehem. So they're extraordinary because it's like where art is first. Do you know what I mean? So even though we've all had issues and mental health stuff, where art is first. And when we come here, we, we, we're artists, do you know what I mean? And we have this thriving community and it's really well supported. You were talking about Beth Elliot when it used to be in like the little port cabins over there, it was just like a little on the the gallery, but now we've got this massive building, and um, it's an amazing space. And the, you know, they've got people. It's run. It's like a charity, but they have uh, Sophie, Amanda, and other people that are working here that really support. You know, everyone that you know facilitate people that want to come and make art. But like you're coming here tomorrow afternoon, you can't get in the workshop room because yeah. there's so many people yeah. in there. I used to, I used to come around and visit Beth and. Get them big. Also taught in here, and they still about it. Then it's still unit. Yeah, yeah. The lock-up one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So on site, yeah, we have a forensics, which is 
people that have been through the criminal justice system, as That's you know. It, yeah. But we also had mothers and baby unit, national unit, psychosis, borderline, you've got eating disorders. So you have like a wide spectrum of people who, you know. I think I've visited most of the wards yeah. and different things that use different people, I don't know. So that's when I used to do all that rolling and crawling. I could like, before the event, I could say anything. You know, you could write up this press release and basically you can be, you know, it's, could just write the best like script what's going to happen what you're going to do and it would already like artists i'm going to eat a small corgi dog so it's already in the papers artist eat to eat a small corgi dog it's almost like the event has happened because you've got this documentation the event itself a lot of the rolling and crawling thing to be honest if you witnessed it in public it just looks like fucking some nutter going along, crawling along the road, pushing a peanut with his nose, and they're like, who's made you do oh, comments like, get up, you crackhead? Who's made you do that? Who's, the, who's, who's, and it'd be all like, uh, you know, the interaction would be with alcoholics and children, you know, because that's the only people that mainly would come up to you, and builders. Oh my God, I remember I, I crawled from London Bridge to Canterbury, with a rose between my teeth. I had 28 boxes of chocolates tied around my wrists and ankles and a big sign on my back which said, could you love me? And I crawled from uh, London Bridge down through, all the way down the Old Kent Road, up through New Cross into Lewisham. And I was going up Lee Eye Road and there used to be a glazers up there. So I'm crawling along, I was all on my own. Crawling along. And all the vans are parked up there. There's a bit of a driveway going up to the shop. And all the drivers are out there. Go fucking hell. Look at this nut up. And they're all going, like, shouting for more of the workers to come out. Like that. He said, what are you fucking, what are you doing? So I was crawling my hands and knees. So I get up on my haunches. So I'm on my knees. The sign's, like, flipped over. I've got the rose between my teeth. And I carry on talking with the rose. And I said, I come from London Bridge, and I'm crawling 55 miles because I'm trying to ask people to be kind to people who are lonely this Christmas. Because last Christmas, I was on my own. Didn't have like family, I didn't even have like, a partner, no girlfriend. I was at home on my own, and all I had was two fish fingers. Oh, you ain't got a bird. Hey, Darren, he ain't got a bird. Darren! Darren, get out of here. So they're calling for Darren. They drag this kid out and they get, get on your knees, Darren. Go on, crawl to Canterbury with him. You might get a bird. <laughs> but from what I thought was going to be like a bit of an altercation at the beginning, you know, where I thought I, I might get a few kicks here, they were like clapping me. They were like, go on, mate. Go on, you can do it. You know, go on, you, you can do it. We'll be there supporting you on your way, clapping me off. I like, crawled off up the high road into the sunset. But that, co that becomes part of the art, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's that's the, even if it wasn't recorded, you've got the story to tell. Yeah, and it, one of the things is, is you've always, you're the best viewer. Do you know what I mean? You're the best viewer. You've seen, you've witnessed it all, like being the centre of the performance. Yeah, because people like, a witness it. it's almost like you know to a crime or something you just see a snippet of it you know in the street but everyone's story makes the thing but the person who's committed the crime they've seen it oh they know everything that's happened do you know what i mean it got me thinking you know when you're watching football and you've got fifty thousand people in the stand all watching a goal being scored from a different angle the goal scorer they've got the best view isn't it so it's like in your life you've got the best view of your life so whatever's going on with your sort of like mental health and well-being, you've got the best view of what's happening, you know, you know, with your death, with relationships, with all those things. Done. When did you become political? Oh, so what, yeah. What happened? Yeah, so growing up, I was a Millwall football fan, like from very young, got into drugs. Went to Ibiza, hedonist. I was out in Ibiza 10 years, 12 years through the summer. 80, 80, 1982 was the first time I went there and stayed till like 94. So, through all that sort of like ecstasy, that was Thatcher. So, Thatcher came round, everyone went, you know, people were signing on, everyone went, oh, fuck this, we're off. 
I swear, next to came, everyone was raving, weren't they? Couldn't handle it, the country was like going raving on a Monday night. You had traffic wardens out, couldn't get to work because they were there. No, every profession, you know, plumbers and they were out, you can all, all eat up, loved up. Yeah, that's when they brought Take That, you know, the boy band? Because you know, um, Prodigy was number one with Firestar. And they were going, oh, it's too mad out there. Get, get, bring bloody Take That in. But um, yeah, so was, that's kind of a, like a political action, the decision to leave and go and listen to music and take drugs. But not really into it in the sense I just wanted to escape from it. But of course when I ended up on heroin and like really like in the Bethlehem, come out and start making art. When I went to uni, I suppose it was when I was at uni, and I started looking, the, the Iraq war had started. So politicised by the Iraq war as well, you know that kind of um, period where I was like, this is horrific, you know, just astounding, quite similar to what's going on now with Gaza, you know, you're just like, but oh, where, where, why, are we, why are we part of this? Why are we doing this? So yeah, like, I got politicised just because I thought um, all the projects I was making, some of them were about like identity and some of them were about like, you know, different things, but it, it, a lot of it became political quite quickly. How has your, your, your art changed since you, since yeah. you were at uni, I suppose? I, I don't know. I, like, I have take, I've done a lot more painting. I've started painting like different things and tried to use different styles and, you know, been making music at the moment, writing poetry, you know, dancing, filming. I want to do it all. You know, I want to do it all. Who do you, who do you make art for? Yeah. I like, so, loads of people, um, when you go through uni and get into, you, you know, you can work with in graphics or work for a company. So quite often that's working to a brief. It's like, I just wake up every day thinking, I need to make something. What am I going to make? But like I tell my students, you know, you shouldn't be driven by um, material. What am I going to do? Am I going to do make a painting? You shouldn't be driven by themes. You should think, I'm going to make something absolutely extraordinary. So that should be your starting point. Now, we've all seen like... I mean, in the art world, we're up against Rembrandt and Picasso, and you know, they're still hanging in the, in the galleries. So we have to make something that's extraordinary. We have to think, what can I make that's going to make people laugh? What can I make that's going to make people cry? What can I make that I'm going to have to pick someone up at the floor because they're going, oh my God. No, what are you going to make that's going to make people uh, say, have you seen this? Have you seen it? You know, and they send it to like their friends and go, oh my God, look at this. You know, we know those things, you know, and whether you're, you know, whether you're making music or you're writing journalism, you've seen great articles and you think, what made that a great article? What made that writing so special? Um, who, you know, whether it's the headline, whether it's the, you know, how that piece was written, how can I do that? You know, how can I make myself a better artist? How can I make something that's extraordinary? And I say to the students, you know, don't just think I'm going to paint six trees. Paint one tree. Make it the best fucking tree ever. Make it a masterpiece. Make it so people go, oh my God, look at that tree. You know, and that's how I think that's, you know, sometimes if you can catch yourself before you make a piece and tell that to yourself, you know, even if you get a little bit along that scale towards that, you'd be like, you'd be making something, you know, that, that, that's legacy, that's last, that, that's kind of legendary, that's like, oh, that's incredible. Who have you been influenced by in the art world? Yeah, I get influenced by everybody and everything. You know, everything that I touch on and see. I was with this um, Cara May yesterday. 
She's this uh, really old woman. I, uh, you know Hill Station Cafe? It's in Telegraph Hill Park at the top of the thing. So I met her, I took her out for lunch yesterday. She, she's an author, she writes children's books. And she was telling me, so she's writing a film script. She's turned things into plays and musicals. She's written librettos and things, she's telling me. Anyway. And she's written this thing about the dream snatcher. So it's Jody and the dream snatcher, this fella comes to town and he's got loads of money and he tells them, I'll give you money, sell me your dreams. So all the town, they're like, yes, do you know what I mean? Have my dreams. He's giving them like gold everywhere. But I felt like really inspired to be in this, you know, elderly woman's company who was just like telling me this extraordinary story. I was transfixed, it took about 15 minutes to tell me. I was just like having the soup made me a soup and I was just like listening to her. But yeah, we get inspired by everybody and everything, don't we? You got a favourite artist? Favourite artist? Even if you don't kind of let it influence your work, you've yeah. got a favourite you always like looking at. Well, there's this guy, I always like quote him, his name's Alexander Brenner, but he's a bit, he's a bit off key, no one like, like it's About two weeks later, I was lying down in Brick Lane I was doing a performance in the street. I had a white t-shirt on, a big like knife in me, covered in blood, it was about a knife crime. And I was just lying in the street and people were just walking by. Do you know what I mean? So it was about it was about knife crime. At the time there was a lot of a lot of people who died. I remember one year there was like 50 people died in London. And so um, I was lying down there with my eyes closed, a baseball cat, a hoodie, and this kind of like fake blood. And I heard do you think this? Do you think this is art? What do you think this is? Is this art? And I look up, and it's fucking Alexander Brenner, the guy who done the shit up two weeks before. And I says, Alexander Brenner, and he went, No, I'm not. Who's that? Completely denied who he was. Do you know what I mean? Like he'd been captured or something. I said, Yeah, I was on the stage at the thing. Ended up becoming mates with him. Like, so he goes into the show, I was outside the show, the show was in the Truman Brewery. So he goes in the Truman Brewery, does the shitter, and starts putting on all the paintings, and wiped it on his face and started like, art, art kissing people. Like that with this shit on his face, it was a fucking terror. I ended up, like he, he I met him in the, in the elevator gallery and he came in and he had a massive piece of meat that he gave me, so I brought you this. Just like a piece of meat, disrupted the show, like caused chaos, kicked over all the stuff. But yeah, you asked me, who do you admire most? Who, 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 I just who, thought this guy's like, he's, in a, he's an extremist, but um, he's into um, one of the philosophers, well, I can't remember his name, Gam a Gamban, he's into a Gamban, but like he's into nomads and just like, he does screaming things that, Exhibitions like uninvited, just goes. So he's an art screen. interrupter rather than an art yeah, yeah. maker. But he's like, he's danger. Do you know he's danger, danger. But like, I think he, he did a thing at Goldsmiths and they invited him to Goldsmiths. Someone went, oh yeah, let's get Alexander Bremer in there to talk about like, um, you know, why is he like this? Why does he do all things like that? In the lecture theatre, he just smashed it up, just got all the chairs, wrecked the place. So within one second, they've been being introduced. Right, so this is Alexander Brenner, he's come to talk about his work today. Just like so smashing the place, run everyone out of it. And got dragged out, called security. Um, so, you beat cancer? Yes. What yeah, point? had bowel cancer, that was like in about 2012. Yeah. yeah. So that's a really good thing. So there was an advert on the radio. It said, oh, you've got blood in your stool, which was a prompt. And I was thinking, I had blood in my stool about two months ago. Should I go to the doctor? Went to the doctor. He said, you should go for a test. So I went to the pro. You know the pro? Yeah. Up in the pro. Went in, done the thing. He said, yes. Took it out. Next minute, oh, you've got to go see the doctor. Oh, well, it's okay. It's cancerous. So um, five years of, you have to keep going going still kind of under them at King. So once you get cancer in the NHS, they keep checking you all the time. Yeah, I've just put a sample in this morning. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah, it's good yeah, to do it because they... Yeah, yeah it's... Catch it early, you've got a job. Exactly. 
Yeah, it makes you want to make more art quicker. I suppose you, you wanted, yeah, you always think about like how much time you've got left. Like I'm 60 this year. So you think, you know, you see people dying and it's in the news. Like joking here, who was the manager down at Wimbledon, 77. And you think, wow, fucking hell, I ain't got long then. If, if everyone's going at, in their 70s, dad died when he was 76, 75. So, yeah, you ain't got long. And it's, you know, it is, um, like one of the paintings that I do, today's the best day of your life because it's the only one you've got. You know, and to do, like, you know, we think of simple things, you know, like having a shower or a shave or, you know, make it the best shave ever, make it the best shower ever. Don't think of things as being a chore. You know, enjoy the things, you know, making a cup of coffee, making some food or, you know, spending time with family and friends. I'm going to go and see mum after. Mum lives up in West Wickham. She's got the Alzheimer's and dementia. So, yeah, I wrote a big epic poem about her called um, What's Going to Happen to All My Stuff When I Die, which was a question that she asked me. And I did a 10-hour street performance about a month ago in Campbell. What next for you after this? What well, this show, yeah. You've got plans, got plans. Oh, yeah, I've started the Wardrobe Gallery. So I've, started, I've opened my own gallery. It's called the Wardrobe Gallery. So it's a gallery inside a wardrobe. But there are lots of wardrobes. So I buy a wardrobe and I give it to someone and they do something with it. There's one in Contingency Works in Bromley right now. Um, an artist called Mug is working on it. Really spectacular what they're doing. So, do you know um, contingency works? No. Do you know uh, the glades? Yeah. So as you go into glades, there's a little boots there. What if you're going in from what end? Uh, oh no, but the, the bottom, boots end. Yeah, yeah the, the boots bottom end. Yeah, yeah. So you come up, and there's the glades there. You go in, just there, the little boots next door to the little boots by the ice cream shop. Okay. There's a contingency works, which is a hot desk in like a little um, office space. <coughs> yeah, I bought a Gehrings and Willow um, wardrobe. Do you remember Gehrings and Willows? Willow department store. Yeah. And I bought like a big wardrobe in West Wickham. Do you know the fire station antique shop? I know the fire, fire station, yeah. In West Wickham. Yeah. And they turn it into like an antique okay. shop. Yeah, in there. So, you can have lots of wardrobes, you yeah. can have only one place. No, they're everywhere. So, the, the, the exhibition is yeah. dotted around. And there's only one artist ever works on one wardrobe. No one else comes to do it after. It stays as it is. So, it's like you know, those open studios, places where you walk around yeah. an area. Well, where, where one's in an office, the other one's in the Isle of Man. So, it depends. They can be anywhere. <laughs> um, you've got a big online presence now, is yeah. that, is that, did you, you just got, you got yeah. involved with, with, yeah. with, because that seems to be the way for everything, not just artists. I know. It is good though, in a way that, you know, this space is quite difficult to get to, but you do know, tell your readers, that you can get the super loop from Bromley now. It's a bus that goes straight here from Bromley train station, Bromley South. So Victoria, 15 minutes to Bromley South, jump on the super loop, you're straight here. Because places are difficult to get to. Because the nearest station is a couple of miles away, isn't it? Eden Park. Eden. Yeah. yeah, but you get the super loop bus now. Right. Or you can get the inter hospital bus from okay. the Maudsley, but you have to be like patient or service user to get on okay. that. Yeah, special bus pass. Um, yeah, I think it's it's good to have the online stuff because you can reach so many people and you can reach, you know, global audience. But while you're kind of <coughs> putting content on, you know, if not every day, several times a week, is that kind of... No, I do the art stuff every day. Is it every day? Yeah, every day for 14 years. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that, is that kind of a way of... Thinking, I haven't got to do any other art. This is art. No, I can't. Is it, is it, not, is it, not, is it not taking the place? No, I like, I like, I come here. I come here. I'm here, like, 
Wednesdays I'm here doing workshops, Fridays I'm in textiles here doing workshops. Yeah. Honest to God, right, the people here are so good to get yeah. It's cool. a really good space. You know, and places like this need to exist. You know, it's, um, the other thing is, is music and well-being, just to say, it's so impactful. Like my mum, I said, as the Alzheimer's, I go, she's Irish, I've got to put the Dubliners on. And it's spurred to memory, do you know what I mean? She gets all happy where she's down, just watching like anything that's on the telly. But music is such an important well-being thing for everybody, you know, regardless of your mental state. But it's emotional, you know. Uh, we listen to music when we're in love, we listen to music when relationships break down, we're listening to music because of identity, where we're from, bands, genres, different types of music, in music that we invest in. We're sung to lullabies as babies. And then we pick the music for our own funerals. You know, throughout our lives, you know, from cradle to grave, this impact that music has on us. So um, I've just been, they've got a library here. I've just been down there, I've got 16 books out. Um, on uh, music and um, mental health, music and well-being, music and uh, the history of like mental health, but also there's a guy Oliver Sacks. He wrote like, I think in, uh, the man who mistook his wife for a hat, which is like about I think that's about Alzheimer's. But he wrote one called uh, Music Ophelia, which is about um, uh, music and how it helps uh, music in the brain, because you know this. Um, really big musicians know about brain worms. So brain worms are like the bit that you remember. So there are jingles in parts of songs. There are little pieces of music that last three, four, five seconds. That you could be anywhere, it could be any time in your life, and you will hear that little bit. It might be just a riff, but it's a fucking worm that goes inside your head that transports you back to you in your school uniform when you first heard that song. You know, and there's little, um, you know, words, titles of, you know, two or three lines from a song that you'll never forget, that you'll hum and you'll sing all day, and new ones to come. Yeah, I, I kind of get that. I, 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 all of a sudden, you're, you're singing a song you only know for years. Yeah. Think, what, why are why you singing, singing that? that? If you backtrack, because on the news they said a word that might yeah. be in the title in that yeah. lyric, and I'm, even if it's a song that I would like, yeah. it, it's like, hey, I'm singing, singing that. that. You backtrack, and it, it's that 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 word that you catch yourself. You're travelling along, yeah. and you're singing it, and you're thinking, what the fuck is that? What am I doing? How does am I singing that? Your brain's like a computer, isn't it? It's like it's in there somewhere, somewhere inside. It's one of those little like connections that like just bring you back to. It's like, have you ever seen that film Ratatouille? So like at the end, he's this really horrible kind of like food critic. Right at the end, the rat cooks him like a ratatouille, which is a really simple dish, just corsets and tomatoes, and it just like phew, brings him back when he was a little kid and his mum's made it for him. No, that's what it's like. Anything you'd like to add, Mark? No, that's good. Yeah, good. Oh, yeah. Subic News, number one newspaper ever. We love the Subic News. <laughs> the Subic News loves so it. Mark the top McGowan. Paper. McGowan or McGowan? McGowan. Yeah, like yeah. Kathy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> nice one, mate. Hey, it's fantastic. Let's, um, let's get a couple of photos. Oh, yeah.